Greetings, friends, and thank you for being with us today on Our Daily Bread. Our Daily Bread is a Bible study that brings encouragement in the Word of God to our friends and those that would love the Lord our God with us and, and share in His fellowship with uh, our brothers and sisters that are with us today. And so we welcome you to be with us and study this topic of the disciples. And we're going to discuss today what it means to be a disciple, a student of the Lord Jesus Christ, and how important the knowledge of the Word of God is in our lives, and how we celebrate the victories that we have accomplished through our Savior and our Lord, and through the knowledge of His Word. And the disciple, the, the term there has two meanings. One is, is a, a student which we use that quite often, and we discuss it um, at length. But it also means a discipline to one. So you see, the world has lost its discipline. And today we see that many times, unfortunately, a lot of the members of our churches have lost their discipline. But discipleship means sold out and dis disciplined unto God, disciplined by the Word of God. Uh, controlled, if you will, and and bordered by the Word of God. And we let God draw our borders for us, you know, and we don't want to get out of His ordained borders in our lives. And then we want to study, because studying the Word, you see, feeds your spirit man. It strengthens your inner man. And it gives you the ability to do the righteousness and the holiness that is required to walk with Jesus. Because Jesus is a righteous God. God is righteous, holy. And so he's different than everybody else. As far as, uh, you know, his standards are very high. And we have to be holy people. Jesus, uh, Jesus said, or God said in the New Testament, be ye holy as I am holy. And so, Come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord. And I'll, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. So we have to come out of something, and that's the world system. And we have to be discipled and disciplined in our lives and taught in our lives. And we have to be students of this great book because, see, on, the only way you can live for Christ and do the things that we're supposed to do in holiness and righteousness is through the strength of the Holy Spirit and the Word of God in you. And if there's little word in you, then there's little strength to be to really perform as a Christian. Your your strength level is determined by your discipleship, by your study of God's Word, because if you're feeding your spirit, man, then you're strong in the spirit and you can do great exploits for God. And you will know the Word of God, and it will strengthen and fortify, and it will it, it will put the conviction in your heart that you don't want to sin, that you want to be walking with Jesus, you know, and it'll give you the capacity and the ability to rise up above the flesh, and ab above the world, and ab ab above, um, you know, um, a natural carnal mind, and then having done that, then you can then find the strength. To be a Christian because you can't really be a Christian in your own strength you know if you're uh, if you're not trained if you're not if you're carnally minded and if you're not feeding your spirit and if you don't have the Holy Spirit working effectively in your life then you are ill-equipped to be performing on the level you was intended to perform at. so discipleship then becomes very important and, and uh, being a student, feeding the spirit man becomes very important. Being scholars of the word of God, as Karen uh, said to me in an email, uh, is very important. And so we would like then to enjoy, or enjoy your presence with us as we study this topic. So stay with us and let's discuss the disciples. Okay, and so let me clarify. Um, I'm, I guess I'm leaving it as cliffhanger, so I won't do that. So let me explain that you are a disciple if you love Jesus. If you've accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior, now you're his disciple. 
And so let's see the way disciples are trained today. And I'd like to say uh, that uh, Brother J.D. has a scripture for us. He says, praise the Lord who hath carrieth our burdens day after day. He is the God who saves us. Psalm 68, 19. That's right. He's the God that saves us. See, we're living in a, a terrible world that has forgotten God. You know, and people say, well, oh, it ain't that bad. Well, when's the last time you watched the evening news? Or when's the last time you went to the supermarket and seen uh, mean-spirited people fuss at children and, and be out, be too strong, too hard on them, and that kind of thing? And, um, and when have you seen a teenager talk back and walk out of the house mad at their daddy and squalling tires down the road or something like this? You see, we have problems in this world, and these problems can only be fixed by a relationship with Christ in your life. And so we want, we want to discuss that with you today. And so let's start with prayer, if you would. Father, I thank you, Lord God, for your promises and your word. I thank you for your grace and your mercy and your love and kindness toward us, Lord, and how you oversee us and your oversight in our lives, and how remarkable it is that you would give your son that we might be saved and with us today. Help me to stay out of the way. You said where two of you are gathered in my name, there am I in the midst. So help me to stay out of the way and, and to sit with you, my brothers and sisters here, at your feet and be taught of you. And uh, I'm no better than they are. I'm just a brother in the Lord. And uh, we're all just fellowshipping and disciples of yours. And we want you to teach us today through your Holy Spirit. So we ask you to pour out your spirit to us and teach us uh, here in our Bible study today. In Christ Jesus' name, we'll give you the praise and the glory. Amen. Glory to God. Well, I have two wonderful people with us today. We have uh, Sister Karen, who is a minister in her own right. She has 20-plus uh, years' experience in the church, and she's a mentor to 387 wonderful ladies. And uh, she's a great teacher and a strong believer in the Word of God and a great disciple of the Christ. And then also we have another great disciple with us today, Brother J.D., and he has um, been serving God all his life, ever since he was a child. And so he has a tremendous 20-plus year uh, work in progress in his life, and he's a great scholar, and, and, uh, and he loves the Word. He loves Jesus, and, and he tries to show his love for Christ every day. And so what a blessing it is to have this dear man with us today and our sister, Karen. So we're going to begin our study today in uh, John chapter 14. And it's Jesus speaking. And I'd like to pick up the reading from verse 15 to 27. And Jesus speaking says, if you love me, keep my commandments. And we mentioned this yesterday that that there is 153 commandments in the New Testament. One is to love thy neighbor as thyself. And the other one is to go into all the world and preach the gospel. Um, and so we could go down the list, but there's uh, 153 commandments of the New Testament. Now today we're being taught in popular circles, and that's why they're so popular, is that there is no laws of God to be concerned with anymore. And there is no work that needs to be done. And that is a anti is an unbiblical position. That is absolutely unbiblical. We're taught that Jesus is coming one day and all we have to do as Christians is just sit back and let it happen. And, and that'll be all right. Nothing's required of you. And uh, you don't have to keep no laws and you don't have to do anything for Jesus. And that's a mistake. Uh, men and women of God, we can't believe it that way. It's just not biblical. You see, this is Jesus speaking right here, and he says, keep my commandments. Now, we know Jesus was God. And at the time he spoke this, there was only one set of commandments, and that was that he that, that would be the written commandments, and that would be the, the Ten Commandments. And the reason we say that the Ten Commandments are still important, first of all, we don't want to sound legalistic, so please don't turn off this, the study here today. But consider that God wrote the Ten Commandments with his own finger at the top of Mount Sinai 
unto Moses. So the Ten Commandments were not written by man. God himself etched with his own finger the Ten Commandments onto the tablets that Moses had prepared for him. And so these commandments were given by God. That's number one. Number two is that the Ten Commandments cover basically two points. Love for God and love for your fellow man. And so these principles of love still continues to this day. And that is because the scripture says in the New Testament that God is love. And so if we're in tune with the God of Israel, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, then we then by very nature want to love. And then most of the Ten Commandments were given uh, in subsequent writings by the Apostle Paul. An example of this is Ephesians, where in the book of Ephesians he said to honor thy father, father and thy mother. And so... You see, that was one of the Ten Commandments. And Paul reiterated it within the New Testament writings. Okay, and so then the next point on this would be that if you would like to look at it on a theological um, and a, a testament, a testimonial basis, then please understand that even if it's not legally required, by the dictates of the New Testament to keep the Ten Commandments, that they are certainly beneficial to God's overall work in our lives. And there is nothing wrong with wanting to keep and honor the Ten Commandments in our lives today. So, you see, as a disciple, we're disciplined, and we're disciplined by these commandments, even though they're in the Old Testament. They're still good, um, um, a good reality check as to how well we're doing according to what the Father likes, you know. And then also in in final uh, mention of the uh, new uh, the Ten Commandments, let's mention the fact that John told us that all Scripture is given by God and is profitable for reproof and for correction and for instructions in righteousness. So then at the very least, you could say, would be that the Ten Commandments are instructions in righteousness. So therefore, you, we can't just throw the Ten Commandments away. Okay, and then the next thing to mention in our study here is what Jesus said, as we mentioned here in our opening verse. And that is that Jesus said that if you love me, keep my commandments. Okay, and so, um, so Jesus had some commandments that he gave, and as believers, like I said earlier, the the church has been duped into thinking, well, we're living in a, a hyper grace, which means you can live like the devil and go to heaven, and that's just simply not true. It says that straight. Jesus said that straight is the gate, and narrow is the way that leadeth to everlasting life and few there be that find it so this is a walk of holiness and righteousness and uprightness of heart and mind this is a sail out of your entire being to the cause of christ and to the word of god and to make the word of god supreme in your life and to make it your um uh sop your standard operating procedure is the word of god and so this then means that we can't have hyper grace where we can go to church on Sunday and um, and then go out in the parking lot and fuss with somebody about the parking space and then continue to um, live all type of uh, meanness and things throughout the week. And then, you know, if something were to happen to you, heaven forbid, then you would think according to that teaching, you would go to heaven. But I submit to you that you you have left walking with Christ if you're living that way and it's not just a do anything go kind of gospel 
It's a holiness and, and a righteousness that need, it's being birthed in you from from uh, receiving Christ as your Savior and from study of the Word and from being disciples of Christ. And so you in, in inspire in yourself to to uh, to greater heights, to come out from among them and be separate, be holy. That's what that means. Separate means holy. Okay, be holy. As I am holy, the scripture says. So, God is holy and he wants holy children. And, you know, we we in, depend on his grace. And we don't negate his grace. And we have to have his grace. And we're not perfect. But we certainly do all we can to walk uprightly before him. And it should be our heart's desire to be upright before God day and night all the time so um, there's a verse that says then shall you call upon me and i'll say here i am see when you're living the right uh, a life of righteousness and holiness then you can call on the lord and he'll show up he'll listen to you he'll hear your prayer and and um, you can be assured that he'll hear your prayer because you're walking with him and you're walking up right and um and, it, and it's a blessing then to know that we as believers are walking upright and that um, that we have uh, a chance to serve a God that loves us, serve him and to be his disciples. And we want to be good disciples of Christ. You know, John, you know, J, uh, uh, some of his disciples said, well, which one of the us as the greatest among you as your disciples you know they want they they were jockeying if you will for position they wanted to be the best disciples among them you know and so you know i i can't pick them but you know peter certainly stands out and john and james and andrew seems to be the strongest of the disciples you know and i'm not the judge and i'm not saying that, that that's the case but I'm saying in my own heart, that's, you know, I, I'm fond of Peter, James, and John, and Andrew. And they, but they, they wanted to be good disciples, you see. And we need to have the same desire to be good disciples of the Lord. And the, the world needs to see good discipleship again. Because they hadn't been seeing it too often here lately. Okay, and so having said that and understanding that we want to keep God's commandments in the New Testament, let's look in verse 16. It says, and I pray thee, and I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, capital C. He's referring to the Holy Spirit. That he, he's, the, he's one third of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit is, that the Holy Spirit might abide with you forever. You see, the Holy Spirit has come into you, and you can grieve the Holy Spirit, and you can quench the Spirit. And when you grieve the Spirit is when you sin, and when you quench the Spirit is when uh, you offend. And, um, and so you don't want to quench the Holy Spirit. You've got to be mindful that He's in your heart and, you're, and, and there to comfort you and to teach you. And the fact that you need his strength in order to be a Christian. So you don't want to sin and weaken the Holy Spirit in you. And you don't want to offend him. Because he's a, and anybody will tell you this, he's very gentlemanly. He's easily offended. He's very sensitive. And so his presence will lift off of you for a time if you offend him. And then... When you get your heart right and you talk to him about it, then then it'll come back. The strength will come back on you. But the anointing sometimes will lift like that if you offend him somehow. So you see, we're this is a real time walk with the Lord, and we want His presence and His anointing to be on us, so we can be effective in the kingdom of God and in our own lives as well. You see, you're not being a Christian for no reason. You want to raise children as Christians. You want to help your neighbors and your community as, as Christians. You want to, to um, be a benefit to the kingdom of God uh, as a Christian. You want to help our state and our countries 
uh, respectfully in anything we can do that would advance the kingdom of God and the, the purposes of God on the earth. You're here for a reason. And so perfecting our discipleship becomes very important because uh, the stakes are great. You know, the stakes will play out in eternity. And so the stakes are very high. And we want to do our utmost, you know, for his highest. There was a book written by that name, by the way. I'll mention it for those that are like to read. It's called, it was by Charles uh, uh, Chambers. And uh, it's my utmost for his highest. And he was a missionary in the nation of Egypt during the beginning of World War II. And those were his Bible lessons. Um, and he died a premature early death from a disease he caught in Egypt. But after the war, his wife published the, uh, uh, the book. And it's uh, my utmost for his highest. And it's a very good book as it really talks to how you want your heart to be with the Lord. And uh, you may be able to find that online uh, and read it in PDF. I'm not sure about that. But um, it's my utmost for his highest. And see, we're trying to give all we can for Jesus because we all acknowledge time is short. And, you know, we don't know when it might be, 5, 10, 20 years, whenever Jesus gets here. But we want to have something that we've done for him that means something to him. And so we do that by being good disciples. And so here the Holy Spirit, though, has come on to you. To you. And that's what Christ is saying to his disciples here, that he's going to send the Holy Spirit to you. Verse 17 says, even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive. So the people that are unsaved that don't know the Holy Spirit is working in the earth, won't believe in him because they can't see him. And it's what it says, whom the world cannot receive because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but you know him. So JD, I know Brother J.D. knows the Holy Spirit and Sister Karen, they flow in the Spirit all, all the time. And so, see, it's the intimate knowledge of him, knowing his um his ways, his leadings, and the voice of the Lord that will speak to your heart. And, you know, and sometimes he'll say, read Psalms 27, and 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 it'll be the Holy Spirit. And you say, sir, yes, sir. And you go read the, the Psalm 27, you know. But see, you have to know him, and you have to be close to him. You have to let him flow in your life. And we do that through obedience and by being disciples, disciplined and taught the things of God and it's a growing process and you grow into it and it becomes richer and deeper and more intimate as time goes and so it says here that the world can't ha receive him because it doesn't know him but that you know him for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you see the Holy Spirit is in you if you accept Christ and then he says, verse 18, I will not leave you comfortless. So Jesus made a promise that you would have the anointing of the Holy Spirit in your life. Because he wasn't going to leave you comfortless without a comfort tour. He wasn't going to leave you without some spiritual, um, uh, un, uh, somebody, a spiritual force to lean on. So he sent the Holy Spirit to take up residence in you. As you accepted his son, Christ Jesus. Okay. And then he says, I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. Yet a little while. And the world seeth me no more. But ye see me. Because I live. Ye shall live also. At that day. Ye shall know that I am in my father. And ye are in me. And I in you. So he says, one day you'll see that we were always intimately connected, Father, Son, and you. And through the personage of the Holy Spirit and, and the Word of God. And so, in other words, you see, you, you're engrafted into Christ. And, and you flow in the Word of God and the, the Spirit of God. And so you're, in, you're in, interconnected with Christ. 
and that's why you have dual resident uh, citizenship. You are seated with Christ in heavenly places, and then you're here on earth at the same time. And, and the Word of God and the Spirit of God is the conduit the, that that keeps you connected to our spiritual Father. And so, this is something then that's being perfected within you, and God wants to perfect it and make it better and richer and deeper as you uh, as you follow him in these things okay and then verse 21 he says he that hath my commandments and keepeth them so here we're back to the commandments again jesus speaking himself so he says he that hath my commandments and keepeth them he it is that loveth me Okay, so that is the acid test of whether we love the Lord is whether we're keeping his commandments or not. So this really rains on this anything goes lawless, workless gospel that's been floated around these days. See, this is Christ speaking, and I don't know how you, anybody could overcome the fact that Jesus Christ, the son of the living God that died on the cross, was raised from the dead, our Savior. And our master and our Lord himself stated that if we kept his commandments, then we showed love to him. And that so he obviously wants us to do that. And so it, let's read it again for the doubters. It says, he that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. And he that loveth me shall be loved to my father. And I will love him and will manifest myself unto him. So here we see love, keeping the commandments, and the Lord manifesting in the same sentence. The three, the three prerequisites, if you will, love in Jesus. And it, by and showing and proving that you love him by keeping his commandments and then expecting that he will manifest because you love him and keep his commandments. And so naturally, as we mentioned earlier, we're discussing then the commandments in particular of the New Testament. But then also we're honoring uh, um, to stay out of legalistic uh, debates. We're honoring also then the Ten Commandments as well. And let's look at this one a parable that Christ said to the rich young ruler. He said, um, the Lord, I've done this and I've done this. And, and um, uh, he, Jesus says, well, how do you read? And, and the rich young ruler, he quoted all Ten Commandments. And what was Jesus' response to that? He said, well, you're not far from the kingdom of God. But see, uh, wealth had gotten the better of him, and he had wealth in his heart, and he had. So he told him to go sell everything and to come and follow him, because his God was his riches, in other words. So Christ still required something in addition to that, because he had a, an idol in his heart, which was wealth. And but no, nevertheless, Christ stated that the man was close to the kingdom of God because he kept the commandments. You see, so these commandments are not done with, you know, and just because there are a few books back that, you know, there's still instructions in righteousness. And then we have the New Testament commandments to contend with as well. And so what is our study today? Then the study is, is that we're disciplined by this book and that the commandments of God are still very important if we want to see the manifestation of God in our life. And we do. And then that we prove our love by having respect for his commandments. And we could take it one step further and say that you show your love by respecting the word of God. You know, and we talk about this. You hear it mentioned sometime, and it's based on a Bible verse. And that is the whole counsel of God. See, the whole Bible is, is the counsel of God. It's in its entirety from Genesis to Revelation. It's the is God's message to mankind, you know, and it's it's played through the kings of Egypt, um, Israel, you know, and you go back into the book of Kings, for example, let's just 
you know, in general terms. If you look in the book of Kings or the Chronicles, you will see that this king got to come to power and he did what was right in the sight of the Lord. And he reigned 56 years in Jerusalem. And so then he slept with his fathers and was buried with the kings. So he was an honorable man. He kept the Lord, the ways of the Lord. And he had a long life and, he, and a long reign in as king. So he was successful. And then the, the next king, for example, or a couple of kings later, will, it'll say, and, and this king did what was evil in the sight of the Lord and kept not the way of the Lord and went in the way of Baal. And he, he reigned eight years and, uh, you know, was killed or he, or he got a disease and, and he was not buried with the kings of Israel. So you see the ones that did right by according to the word, they got to live a long time and reign. And the ones that didn't do right, well their reign didn't last too long and they they were discredited, dishonored. So it's the people that do right that God honors, you know. And and the people that have respect for his word. And those are the disciples of today. If we can find some, and I know I know they're out there, and uh, I know we need we want to be those kind of disciples, a student and a disciplined one, and a scholar for Christ. And so, this watered down, cheap version, artificial version of the gospel is not going to cut it. And if you want real a real encounter and experience and relationship with Christ, we have to give him the real thing from us we have to do what he says and we have to honor his word and and that's the goal but now there's rewards for doing it so it's not one-sided if you do what's right then you'll be like the good kings you know you'll reign in life and you'll do well and he wants you to do well and you'll be a strong christian you'll have strong results and you'll have an intimate walk and you can call upon the lord and he'll say here i am you see, that's a, that's the actual Bible verse that you can call upon the Lord and he will say, here I am. And so that's what we need in the world we live in. We need him to say, here I am you sometimes, you know, to show up when we call on his name, you know. And, um, you know, he showed up for Elijah when Elijah called on his name and, and Elisha, Elisha, I mean. OK, and so those two prophets and when Daniel cried out to him. He showed up, you know, and so when David cried out to him, he showed up. When Moses prayed, he showed up, you see, and these men were uh, uh, referred to as friends of God. And Jesus said his disciples was going to be friends of God. He wouldn't call them servants anymore. Now I call you my friends. So if we're friends with him, then we ought to respect his commandments and because and, he's God and we respect his authority and we ought to have respect and and be students of this so we can get more equipped to do it and then also that we would be disciplined and please him and not grieve the holy spirit let's go to our next passage if you would with me and it's second uh, timothy chapter 3 verse 16 and it and this is the one that we mentioned earlier and it's worth reading it says uh, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. See, it's a benefit to this book, the whole counsel of God, Old and New Testament. And is profitable for doctrine, for reproof. Doctrine means teachings, by the way. Doctrine means for, uh, you know, you hear people say, well, you know, that's their interpretation or that's their interpretation or whatever of the scripture. We don't go by anything of that nature. If you hear somebody saying that, then that they're in error. The Bible interprets the Bible. So if you have a, a, any position, no matter what it is, if you say, well, this verse means this, well, then you should be able to qualify that with at least two to three other verses in the scripture that say for the most part the same principle and 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 is and can be readily understood as meaning the same concept so scripture interprets scripture 
so there is no there's no you or uh, me or the them involved in interpretation of the scripture the scripture interprets the scripture okay it's self-qualifying if you want to say it that way it it authenticates itself just like a code book would in the military it has it authenticates its own self so all viewpoints should be authenticated that way okay and so then it's not an interpretation anymore it's a, a, a authenticated fact you know and so as disciples you see the whole counsel of god will allow you to do that so that you're not led away by uh, every wind of doctrine and things like this but here we see that the, all the scripture is by inspiration of God and is profitable to you for teachings. So it's the word that is the teachings. Not anybody's opinion, including mine, you know. Uh, that's the, I'm very word-centered. That's why I stay with the word all the time. It's because the, that the word speaks for itself, you know. Okay, and so it says that this is profitable for you as doctrine and for reproof. You know, reproof means, well, you know, you read that this way and then you read a few chapters over and then th that chapter reproved what you thought the other chapter meant. And so, therefore, you have come then to a, a re-examination of that topic and that topic then has uh, been enlightened into you by other reading of the scripture. And, and so you can um, stay middle of the road in the scripture way. It reproves your thinking. And then for correction, so it'll tell us when we're right and we're, when we're wrong. And for instructions in righteousness. And there we have it. So we want the instruction of righteousness. And it's from the whole counsel of God. Then verse 17 says, That the man or woman of God may be perfect. And it could mean perfected. You could say that as perfected in the Greek, perfected, uh, you know, um, um, polished, if you will. Okay, perfected, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. So you can be thoroughly furnished in the Word of God, as you um, as you let the Scripture be your guide and your leader and your inspiration and your truth, and and as you allow yourself to be a student and a scholar and a disciple uh, disciplined one of Christ and so um, brother JD we're getting a few minutes close to our hour mark and with y'all's permission I'd like to go a few more minutes um, 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 to be quite honest I've lost track of time so if somebody knows how many minutes we're at uh, please let me know um, but I've been focused on this is the Lord just telling us very clearly that that, you know, his word is has got to be. Yes, yeah, what I okay. Thank you, sir. His got his, his word has got to have a higher standard than it's been getting. I mean, you can't put this book beside War and Peace, behind beside the Old Man in the Sea, beside uh, uh, you know Macbeth or um, the Shakespearean literature. You know, this is not literature. This is ancient writings of God Almighty through his people. We just read the verse on it. So this book is not to be, uh, you know, compared to other books. This book is holy and it is eternal. And it's God's writing to man. And more importantly, God's writing to you and to me. And so it makes this book so very important that we understand it properly. And that we don't just discount it as, well, it's good literature, you know, it makes me feel better. Or, um, or, or um, you know, well, it's got some good points in it, you know. No, this is the writing of Almighty God. And he wants us to respect it. And then he can use it to make impact that way. But when we compare it to other works of literature or something of that nature, then, then we've made a bad analogy of the word. Because this nothing holds the preeminence of this holy and holy spirit inspired word of God, the King James Bible, Old and New Testament, the whole counsel of God, 
and when you see it a work in, in some people in your people's lives and, and they're really uh, they're after the whole counsel of God and not just a feel good verse, but they're after the true nitty gritty down to earth fun, fundamental foundational understanding of the book and in, in its entirety. There you will find the true spirit of God and sincere believers and there you'll find the spirit of God at work in, in someone's life. Because, because they they don't want the short version, they want the the whole counsel of God in their life, and as disciples, that's what we have to have, and that's what the first disciples had. They wanted to know everything. They always asked questions of him. You know, they wanted to understand his parables. Well, what did that mean? You know, and they wanted to see his glory. You know. And they then and, and they would say things like, "Well, no man ever spoke as this man spoke, because his wisdom was so deep, you know." And uh, so, so uh, they were infatuated with the personage of Christ, and Christ is the Word of God. So we can have the same devotion and the same interest as they had if we'll put our hearts to it, you know. And we have to do that as believers. If we want to see the greatness of this book, see, the idea is to have this book uh, in your heart and mind and have it to spring forth and flow as living waters from you so that God can uh, send a message through the conduit of the Holy Spirit and the Word of God into your spirit. And then it flow out and help somebody. It'll help somebody that needs it. And then he'll point you to who they, you see. And he so, in other words, God can use you if you'll be a true disciple to him. And he'll manifest himself to you. That's the point. You see him working through you to help somebody. And I can't tell you how many times I've seen that, you know. And I w J.D. did it the other day. Um, we were talking about uh, um, something and... and um, yeah, uh, it was a thing that we're working on, one of our projects that we're working on. And J.D. was putting in the chat box how good it was to have uh, to have a preacher uh, that uh, brought forth uh, good tidings. And he put the verse in there for me. And he didn't know about the education work thing that we're working on. And so we're trying to develop it. It's under development. But, but see, he, he was ahead of me. He didn't know it. And he put it in. He put it in the chat box. And so the Spirit of the Lord was encouraging me that through that, that um, that that's in fact the, His leading and prompting in what I'm working on and stuff. And so, see, that was the Lord, and He did it. He He authenticated what 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 I'm having in my spirit about that program, you know. And so, see, JD was in tune with the Holy Spirit, and only the Holy Spirit knew that. And, and J.D. was operating that in the spirit when he did that. And Karen did it last night in an email, you see. And so the spirit of the Lord, is, it works through his people. And when we are disciples and students of God, then we can flow in the spirit. And we can have um, uh, manifestations such as that happen in your life and you'll say wow god really does know me and he really is working in my life you see so you can see his hand in your life if you'll give him a chance and be a student of the word of god the whole counsel of god and also to be a disciplined one let's read now in first timothy if you would with me a moment and this would be in verse uh first timothy chapter four verse one and two and he says, now the spirit speaketh expressly. When he says that expressly, Paul uses that phrase a couple of times. And it means that he was stern expressly. It means he was speaking, the Holy Spirit was speaking sternly to Paul. So he was serious. That in the last days some men shall depart from the faith. So let's identify this these two words here that says the faith you see there's a number of gospels that are going around these days you know and we mentioned the lawless and the workless gospel in the hyper grace gospel and there's others you know but 
the faith is the faith that is delineated and discussed and taught the doctrine of the New Testament and that and, and also the Old Testament, the faith in God, you know, the faith in the word of God. OK, so in other words, they might have a form of faith, get, you know, have a form of godliness, but deny the power thereof, for example. And the scripture says, if such, turn away. And so the faith is the faith that's in the New Testament, the faith that is given to us by Christ and by the apostles in the writings. That's the faith. Giving heed to seducing spirits, you know, seducing spirits that come over here to this new faith or this new version of this faith, you see. And doctrines, oh, there it is. And teachings of devils, doctrines of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. You see, the, there, there, there's a, the enemy is a counterfeiter by nature. He, he's trying to counterfeit everything God has ever done anyway. But he wants to counterfeit, and that's the difference between having religion in your life and having relationship. The, the faith teaches relationship. And these new uh, versions, you know, are the doctrines of devils, if you will, and they are, um, they are teaching religion. You know, religious activity, rituals, and things of that nature. Ritualistic Christianity, you know and hyper grace and lawless and workless gospel you know that things that can't be qualified in scripture and so we have to we have to have a the real version in our lives and how easy it is to be deceived so you see that's what they're doing the seducing spirits are trying to deceive people and doctrines of devil teachings that they're they sound on the surface there about right but then you get looking at it and they and and some of the, the the tenets of the teaching do not line up with scripture so if it doesn't line up with scripture then it's not the right teachings you know and we have to be very cautious and have the faith being in our hearts and minds okay and so um so this is paul's warning from the holy spirit and and he tells us to be careful and to do that and to to qualify everything that we're uh, uh, taking as spiritual truth to be lined up with the scripture, the whole counsel of God and not to be um, al allowing these new, um, you know, the, you, you hear it said seeker friendly churches, you know, and um, and there was an example of this. Um, here on uh, one of our interstates and uh, I, 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 I hate I hesitate to even mention it but but you drive down the road and there's this big billboard and it says this is not your grandma's church and and then it'll say and it says no healings and no preaching or something like that and then it'll say no wheelchairs and and it's a, I'm, I'm serious it's a billboard that said that so in other words, basically, we don't want no grandmothers here and we're not going to preach at you and we don't want no sick people, handicapped people around our church. Well, see, that's a false gospel. That's not the gospel of the New Testament, you know, and see, there's new versions popping out of the gospel these days, you know, and, uh, you know, renewed, reviewed and revised. And um, so uh, we have to stick to the teachings of the Word of God. We have to be scholars of the, of the Word of God and disciples of and students of this Bible so we can keep our own hearts right about this. If it's not in the book, if it don't line up with the book, then, then it's not the gospel. It's some other faith. It's a, a different version of our faith. And we want the faith that... Uh, scripture uh, tell, Paul warns us about to stick to the faith and so um, the Holy Spirit warned him sternly about this and so we see that and that church is a terrible example of that but I'm telling you honest goodness truth it was a billboard that said that 
and they didn't want they didn't want no sick people, you know. And I don't know how you call yourself a church like that, you know. But they actually had that on uh, a billboard. And um, let's see, Brother JD's got a good one. He says, uh, <laughs> "And how shall they how that shall they preach except they be sent?" As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring tidings of good things. Well, that's exactly right. That's, I mean, and that really blesses me, J.D., that you would say that. It's because we, you know, we need people to get back to the scripture. We need more real in-tuned preachers that really love the Lord and love the Bible, you know, that ha- that are sincere and genuine about it and that will um, help others to understand that, you know, when we get real with God, then we can get close to him and we can live for him and we'll see great things happen. But we have to be real with him, you know, and and we can't be part time Christians. You know, it's it's a full time job, you know, and uh, it's not just a job, by the way, it's an adventure, as I like to say. And um, and so he's got a plan for you. And we'll find out his plan as we love him, keep his commandments. And then the Father will love us and they will come and manifest themselves to us, the Father and the Son. And so, you see, we have to do our part and God will do his part. And this is the task of a disciple in the 21st century, is keeping the word of God in our lives, the whole counsel of God. And taking it as if if uh, if it's in the Old Testament, then it's the instructions in righteousness. And if it's in the New Testament, then it is part of the New Covenant. So it's all important to us, no matter where it's located at in the Scripture. And so, um, so I just wanted then to cover our uh, the importance of being a good disciple today. And I hope you've enjoyed the study. So I trust you have. And so let's close in prayer. And simple, I'd like to mention to you, dear, that this would be available in replay in about seven minutes. Apparently, they do have the, um, they do have it repaired. And I thank Blab for doing that. And if you might want to copy the link just in case, but it worked yesterday properly. So in seven minutes, it'll be available to you. Uh, and it's very good. You'll really enjoy it because um, she's a big word-centered uh, lady, uh, sister in the Lord also. And what a blessing you are, Sybil. Uh, the other day you stayed with it for hours. But, and, uh, so I figured you was jumping up and down and shouting in the Lord because you listened to like four of these Bible studies in a row. <laughs> Glory to God. So, so that's awesome. Uh, so let's pray. Father, I thank you, Lord God, for your mercy and your grace. And I bless you uh, for your study today. I thank you, Lord, for speaking to our hearts and for coming into our midst and giving us a good Bible study today. And I want to bless my brother J.D. and Sister Karen and Sister Sybil, which are, Lord, I couldn't ask for any better brothers and sisters to be with us and study with us. And I thank you for my brother J.D. and all his his um, encouragement that he he's uh, he's been a real blessing to me and sister Karen her email I, that's a blessing to me and and civil for being with us several hours the other day was a blessing to me and so you said that you would bless those that bless me and I ask you to bless my brothers and sisters here today I pray you'll fill, uh, fill them with your spirit and your word that you'll pour out your goodness and and your blessings and that you'll open the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing on them that there won't be room enough to receive and that you will rebuke the devourer for their sakes. And I ask you, Lord God, that you would use this word and replay and 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 in the lives of my brothers and sisters and their work for you in a way that uh, strengthens the hearts and minds of Christians today who are weary, Lord. And so we're thirsty for you, Lord, and we pray that you'll pour out a blessing for us that we might re- partake of it and be true disciples and to walk uprightly and to uh, show others that God is very much on the throne and that Jesus is our Lord and that he that there's a separation between people of the world and the people of God and that we're holy and, and upright before you and help us Lord to witness 
for your name and for your glory, the importance of the whole counsel of God in our lives. In Christ Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Glory to God.